Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Pamela Hastings, Relationship Manager here at Barometer Capital, and welcome to another Wednesday afternoon webcast. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, joining me today is David Burroughs, our President and Chief Investment Strategist. And throughout this conversation, we will provide you with a brief macro overview of the markets and, of course, address questions at the end of the call. If you'd like to send in a question, please feel free to do so. You can hit me up on the chat via Zoom or send me an email, phastings at barometercapital.ca. And with that, I turn the conversation over to David Burroughs. Good afternoon, David. Hi, Pam. How are you? So nice to see your face. Always a pleasure, Dave. And, uh, and I want to welcome all the folks who have joined us today <clears throat> here at the end of the first quarter. Um, I thought it would be useful today to kind of kind of examine two things, sort of the macro, uh, which is the big themes that we think are playing out in current market, uh, and talk a little bit about the micro, uh, things that are going on around quarter end, uh, and things that may have been affecting uh, equities uh, and commodities and, and bonds over the last two to three weeks as we came into quarter end. Uh, so uh, just to always, as always, we start from the top, uh, understand what the big themes are and make sure you're positioned for them. Uh, certainly uh, equities have been in a structural bull market since 2013 in the US, specifically in the S&P, NASDAQ, you know, more so uh, sort of since 2016. Uh, and we've been in this channel for quite some time. Similar channel in the NASDAQ, uh, and there's been ups and downs along the way, but the market has been working its way forward, sort of three steps forward, one step back. Uh, rates have been going through a bottoming process since 2017. It's been a long process, and of course it was a long process when long-term rates bottomed in the late 1940s. And we've been going through a bottoming process in commodity prices, a bear market that's been in place about 10 years. So just to, to, to start with the S&P, which is one of the things that everybody cares about, we're roughly around the same point today as where we were in the middle of February. Market has been consolidating a little bit. We've been highlighting the last couple of weeks that in most of the quarter end scenarios, we've seen some sloppiness, sorry, month end scenarios, we've seen some little bit of sloppiness in the market. And that's because the S&P and equities in general have been so outperforming fixed income that it has caused a sort of phenomenon at the end of each month and certainly at the end of the quarter, which is to say there are certain investors who have a fixed asset allocation, maybe set to 60% equities and 40% bonds. And one of those asset classes outperforms the other, then they square up the position at the end of the month, maybe selling equities that have been outperforming and buying bonds that have been underperforming. And that has been a theme that we've been seeing going on. And certainly there was a very large rebalance coming into the quarter end. Now, I think the most important dynamic continues to be what's happening in the bond market. So you can see that this is a, a, an ETF that owns 20 to 30 year bonds. And the price of, of the 20 to 30 year US treasury bonds has been falling steadily now going back to last year. So in fact, prices peaked out in the US bond market in March of last year and have since fallen quite significantly. Even just since kind of November, the 30 year bond has fallen about 15%, including the coupons that you received coming in. And we highlighted that in the, in the bull market in bonds that we've seen since 1981, where rates, rates peaked out to the bottoming in yields in, in March of last year, or the near-term bottoming, um, we have had now the largest sell-off in the long end of the bond market since the beginning of the bull market <clears throat> in 1981. And I think that's significant because you would expect that if we are seeing a generational shift in yields, then we may see larger sell-offs than we've seen over the course of the bond bull market, which I think could be a surprise to some investors. Now, the reasons bonds might sell off, they can sell off because there's credit risk, but we don't see any sign of that in measures of credit risk that we monitor. But they also could sell off because rates are going up because uh, investors are starting to expect more growth in the economy going forward and maybe what we would call reflation. Not necessarily inflation, although that's possible too. 
So since, uh, since November, especially, there's been a major shift in the market and the things that have led the market, the themes that are leading have been different themes than we've seen in several years. So this is an ETF, which is the RPV, which is an Invesco ETF that owns value oriented securities. So value in this case is, is maybe another name for cyclical. Because growth in the economy has been uh, tepid at best over the last several years, more cyclical, highly levered companies to the economy have underperformed and ultimately became underowned. And as a result, are relatively inexpensive rest of the versus the rest of the market. So we like to see things turn higher that are underowned and that are inexpensive because it means that we can have you know, long runway in front of us if the theme winds up being durable. So when I talk about value, we've seen a real run up in prices and value oriented securities since November. And of course, in the last month or so, we've seen some churning and maybe a little bit of consolidation and corrections happen two ways in the market. One is that you see things pull back in price, which often happens. We also can see things go sideways for a little bit and sort of consolidate gains. So when I talk about value, what are we talking about? Well, certainly in this case, financials fit into the value camp. This is an ETF, the KBE, which owns banks. We can see it's had a wonderful run since the end of October. Certainly again, has consolidated kind of over the last month, but that's a really significant move. And we have lots of exposure here. In fact, the largest exposure we have as a firm is in financials because they are under-owned, because they are uh, inexpensive relative to other groups. And importantly, because so many of them pay you know, good dividends, but that could turn into great dividends as the Fed starts to allow the banks <clears throat> to increase their dividends and buy back shares. And there, there could be some quite significant increases when we get to the June period where the Fed does the stress tests on the banks. And I think that the market could be looking towards that. So JP Morgan has been a large holding of ours. Morgan Stanley has been a large holding of ours. Signature Bank Corp is a large holding of ours. All of these groups coming out of a night, very nice consolidation and really starting to get some ahead of steam. In Canada, Royal Bank, BMO, uh, Commerce, again, all fit in that camp. And then within the financials camp, you know, we also have pretty good exposure to uh, the insurance companies, which of course benefit from a steepening in the yield curve and better financial markets. They make their return by investing the premiums. <clears throat> and so, you know, uh, manual life is an example. Sun life is another example of positions that we have. So lots of financials exposure, and they certainly are consolidating in the near term. Industrials. This is a group that's been hated for years. And many of the old line large machinery companies and industrials really have, have had a bid for the course of, over the course of the last number of months. And, and really, as of a couple of days ago, when the market was sort of about at the worst point it had been in a month, the one group that was making new relative strength highs versus the market was industrials. And those would be companies like Caterpillar, companies like Deer. Again, uh, businesses that have incredible brands, very strong market positions globally, benefit from global reflation uh, and are highly economically sensitive. Transports also in the industrials continue to flourish. And again, this was the only other group that was making relative strength new highs. And, and to put that in context, <clears throat> when I've been running relative strength new high screens over the last number of months, out of 15 or 1800 ETFs, there might be anywhere from 30 to 40 of them making relative strength new highs in various degrees. Uh, but as of two days ago, literally only two, the industrials and the transports. So of course in the transports, it includes the rails, it includes the truckers, uh, certainly lots of truckers acting well. CP is one of the holdings that we have closing in on new highs today after announcing <clears throat> their, uh, their move to buy uh, Kansas City Southern. 
Uh, consumer discretionary, another sort of uh, more economically sensitive group. The, the sheer word discretionary means consumers have a choice to spend the money or not. Uh, lots of stocks in this group. It's a big sector in the U.S. market. Uh, Disney would be a significant holding of ours, a big beneficiary of a reopening. Uh, uh, BRP Inc., which is the spinoff that came out of Bombardier that makes CDUs and, and uh, personal, personal uh, transportation devices. Magna in the auto parts space coming out of a long consolidation, uh, and General Motors and Ford, which both are having a, a great run since late October. Uh, we had GM down at $28, it's at $57, that's, that's a double. Uh, so certainly this group is acting very, very well. So market is expecting the consumer to take some of the stimulus money and spend it. Home builders also within the consumer discretionary group acting very well, making new highs today <clears throat> and several companies within this group interesting. Also in the more economically sensitive theme are the, are the materials. We've been talking about these. They again have been consolidating over the last month, some of the commodities more than others. <clears throat> but again, this is a group that has had a great run since the fall and we would expect to continue on. Energy, which was a newer waiting for us over the last two, three months, uh, pulled back over the last month, but again, has had a really great run off the bottom uh, and is running into some resistance at this point. But some of the companies that we own are things like CNQ and Suncor. So in the macro, the reflationary themes continue to look really attractive and they shouldn't go straight higher. They should have consolidations. And as we've come into quarter end, we're seeing some of that rotation. Uh, other global equity markets. So developed global equities, which didn't break out of long-term bear markets in 2013, like the S&P, they certainly lagged. But now, certainly in the last year, we've seen them come out of long sideways consolidations and start to march higher. Taiwan's a great example. Japan is another great example. Korea is another great example. So again, a group that's been consolidating over the last few weeks, <clears throat> but certainly continues to look really, really good. So at some point when we start seeing change take place, it starts to pose problems for some groups of leadership. And one of the groups that we've seen uh, posed a problem over the last number of weeks has been large cap growth stocks. So we know for several years, secular growth companies have traded at significant multiples, high prices. And they've traded at high prices because growth was scarce. Only so many companies had these long runways of consistent growth. We had that in the late 1990s. And in the late 1990s, when things rolled over in the early 2000s, the economy, uh, as, the, as the, the, the bloom came off the rose for growth stocks, you know, value stocks started to outperform. We don't know that that is the case that will go on for a long time, but we do know that the higher the bond yields go, especially long-term bond yields, the larger a discount rate you would have to use to discount future earnings back to the present. And if you're trading high multiple stocks, you might expect to see high multiple stocks trade at a lower price. And that's something that we've been seeing. So since the middle of February, the NASDAQ in general has been underperforming. This is the NASDAQ 100, the largest NASDAQ stocks. <clears throat> Had a good day today, uh, but certainly, you know, we're seeing some money rotate away from large cap growth stocks and the technology in particular into some of these other groups that are under owned. In particular, the, the, the fastest growing, least profitable tech stocks, this is the ARKK or the ARK uh, Innovation ETF. It owns a lot of small cap technology companies, many of them with no earnings whatsoever, had a spectacular year last year. But certainly we've seen some of the mid cap technology companies come down 30 to 50% in the last six weeks. So this is a group that's been under pressure. And this is a group, as you know, that we've been reducing exposure to for some time. So last week when I put our indicators up, we highlighted that a couple of the long-term indicators had turned down, global equities breadth, the percent of stocks and uptrends had deteriorated a little bit. 
that breadth in Canada had deteriorated a little bit and some of our short-term indicators that the US was still positive. As we sit today, the long-term indicator weakened a little bit more in the US, a little bit more in Canada, a little bit more globally. So what does that mean? <clears throat> it means that some stocks have started to underperform the market. That could be concentrated in specific groups. And it turns out that it is. It has been largely growth stocks that have turned lower. And we'll see whether that is just correction or whether it's something more but something that we pay attention to. So that speaks to the end of the quarter effect. Since November, the long end of the US bond market has fallen about 15%. And since November, we know S&P and other large cap stocks have been up quite a lot. So coming into this quarter end, it looked as though from about three weeks out, there might be as much as $300 billion of equities that needed to be sold to rebalance to fixed income, which needed to be bought. Now, interestingly, in going through that, there really hasn't been a significant positive impact on the bond market, but certainly we saw a pullback in some stocks, and in particular, some of the sectors that have led over the last few months. Not significant, but just something to take note of. And we certainly take note of that. But I wanna just make it very clear. When you break out of multi-year bear markets and then stocks consolidate, it's not the end of the move. So I would be shocked if after two months of getting above this range that the financials have been in since 2007, that that was it. This is a group that's still under-owned. It's a group that's still inexpensive. There are lots of positive catalysts. We've got an improving economy and improving bond market, sorry, steepness of the, of, the, of the yield curve that supports them. So again, I would take any weakness in this area as an opportunity probably to add, and we've been building our positions. <clears throat> home builders. Certainly home builders have been great over the last few months. This is the recovery off the lows back into highs, but we're now just taking out over the last few weeks, the highs back to 2005. Again, that's the beginning of a new structural bull market. Commodities, commodities were in a bear market for 10 years and we'll have to see whether they can continue, but certainly we've just broken the downtrend. That's about six months ago. Some groups behaving better than others. The agriculture stocks, of course, trading right at the highs and behaving extremely well. Um, so this is a group that's favorable. The global growth, the global equity markets, you know, this is Japan just four months ago, having broken out of a range they've been in since 1991. And for energy, while it's still actually not broken out of this bear market, it's challenging this trend line. And we've had a great move higher, probably some room to go likely with the rest of commodities to get through that downtrend. And so again, we've built some positions here. And then lastly, the small caps. After underperforming for many years, they've had a great number of months, certainly since November, significantly outperforming the S&P. But again, probably some evidence of rebalancing that's happened at the end of the quarter. So the reality is we look at these breadth models as a guide to see deterioration or to see improvement. <clears throat> Certainly lots of sectors have seen some deterioration, in particular tech, which is why we took our weights down. Other groups have more traded sideways over the last six weeks and consolidated the gains they had from, from October, November. But the reality is we think that these are more short-term issues. The dividend growth theme continues to look very robust. Our job at Barometer is to do three basic things is to use these breadth tools that we have to recognize new market leadership. And over the last year, it has become increasingly clear that leadership in the market is more about cyclical companies, things that are more economically sensitive. And these are the companies that could have a very long tailwind only just moving into new bull markets. We're always watching for signs of rotation and change when we started to see deterioration in tech and large cap growth, that caused us to pull back from a group that almost universally was favored. 
Now, if our work continued to weaken, we would raise more cash and we do have some cash currently to see where things go coming out of the end of the quarter. But I would say in general, we are encouraged by the fact that the leadership groups have more consolidated sideways than having pulled back significantly in price. So we use that tactical approach to manage the positions. Things that we think are relevant along with those. <clears throat> Despite the fact that we've been seeing some rotation and some consolidation, volatility has remained very muted. So this measure of volatility, going back certainly to the spring of last year where it was exceedingly elevated, and in each of the corrections that we've seen in the market over the last year spiked, really there's been no pickup in volatility. That tells us it's likely to normalize and continue to move lower because if we look at the long-term chart of volatility over the last five years, we've seen volatility at much lower levels, which tended to coincide with very consistent markets. Some economic data, consumer confidence was expected to come in at about 90, came in at 109, way ahead of expectation over the course of the week, that's positive. And, and certainly home prices continue to work their way higher, building confidence in the residential real estate market. Certainly that's an area that we're invested. <clears throat> One of the last things I wanna to share today is another measure of leadership. And there's an ETF, which is well followed called MTM, MTUM. It holds companies that are considered to be more momentum focused companies companies that have built established long-term trends that could continue. We're coming up on a rebalance in the MTUM where they turn over the positions <clears throat> for adding the, the, the new companies that have met the tests and taking out the companies that no longer meet the tests. And it is interesting that technology in the present makes up 34% of the MTUM expected, unless there are major changes at the end of May, to drop by over half to 15%. Financials currently in the MTUM are 4%. Expectation is that will move to 19%. So this fuels demand for these groups. So our job is to get there earlier than that <clears throat> and to be there as these things happen. When we look at the current weightings, by far, our biggest weight is financials, and this has been built over the last number of months. The S&P is 11% financials, we're 36% financials, up from a month ago at 24%. We think this group has a long way to go. Industrials make up 9% of the S&P, we're at 13, up from seven. Energy, we're at 12% versus 3% for the S&P. Consumer discretionary, we still have a relatively muted weight. Materials, we're at over twice the weight of the S&P, but technology is now a very small piece of our portfolios. Now that doesn't mean that this group can't get going again, but at this point, it looks like it may continue to be used as a source of cash to move into some of the more cyclical groups. At the other end of the spectrum, groups that are more tied to falling interest rates, utilities, real estate, and consumer staples continue to be a very small piece of our portfolios. They've actually had quite a good week over the last week. Again, on rebalancing, managers who rebalance back to index weights, and these groups certainly have underperformed over the last three months. So the portfolios as they sit are quite focused, and they look very unlike the index. They are very much reflationary positioned and they are positioned in value, more cyclical groups that should benefit in a new economic cycle, which we think is on the way, and we think will be supported by both fiscal and monetary stimulus, and certainly by consumer sentiment as they come out of COVID. Now, I always like to look at longer term stats, <clears throat> things that have happened over a long period of time. If we go back to 1964 and look at monthly returns for the S&P, April is the second best month of the year. That's encouraging. It's average 1.7%, been up 74% of the time. We are coming into April with some of our indicators sloppy, so we do have a little bit of cash, but certainly money tends to get put to work in the month of April. We keep an eye on that. And then I mentioned last week, <clears throat> when you look at what has happened after the biggest one-year rallies 
it tends to be year two is pretty good. And so we're off to a decent start so far this year. Uh, we think that um, uh, the, the groups that we're in are consolidating a little bit but have very clear signs that this is like their, their strength is likely to continue. We'll watch for any sign of deterioration in these groups and be willing to, to take some money to the sidelines. As always, that's what we do when we get into weaker markets. But as we stand, we, we continue to be pretty optimistic uh, looking out into the rest of the year. So with that, Pam, if there are any questions, certainly we could take them. Yes, Dave. Uh, one question, could you address what is going on with gold with all the <laughs> and money being printed around the world? Shouldn't gold be trading higher? Yeah, and, and you know, we've, we've been talking about that a little bit uh, over the last while. So let's just start with the types of assets that, that you know, we would want to own in the case where we're seeing a lot of money printing. And certainly over the last couple of years, the cryptocurrencies have certainly been a big beneficiary. So there's Bitcoin and it's certainly acting the way that you would expect. Uh, Ethereum is doing the same thing. <clears throat> if we look at a long-term picture of gold, let's see here. Very long-term picture, gold peaked out in 2011, sold off through into 2015, 16, made a turn and had a first leg higher. As is often the case, when you make a new high, you have some consolidation. And we look at that and that absolutely makes sense. It's just that it feels like it's been a long time. This has been going on since August without reversing higher. If we take a look at the gold stocks, it's similar made this turn and now we've been consolidating. You can see we've pulled back to the long-term moving average. If you look at it on a shorter term basis, <clears throat> we've been in this, in this uh, consolidation trend. But I would point out that recently, gold pulled back to a new low here, but the stocks did not. The stocks have held a higher low, actually had a decent day today. So I've been saying over the last few weeks that I think we're likely getting close to making a turn here. I'll highlight that some of the leading stocks like Franco Nevada is in the process of doing that. Newmont is similar. Um, so I think that we're getting very, very close, but you're right. You would expect with all of the money that's being printed. Oh, I'm, I can see now I'm not sharing the screen. Let me see if I can just bring that back up again. Okay. So um, here's, the, here's the gold chart. Came back and tested these recent lows. And again, I'll put the very long-term chart up. This was the, the turning gold in 2015-16, the run to new highs, and this has been the consolidation. And it's consolidated about a third of the move from, from the lows. And if we look at what's happened to the gold stocks, they've been similar, similar type of consolidation. It feels like a long time because it's been like six months, but that's, that's what often happens. You pull back into the level that it broke out from. So we've been saying over the last while, we think we likely are getting close. And if we take a look at the one year chart of those same pictures, you'll see that the gold itself has just pulled back and retested this low from early in March, but the gold stocks have held at a higher low. And as I mentioned, companies like Franco Nevada look like they're getting ready to come out of this range that they've been in. So I'm encouraged. And given the fact that all of the other themes that would benefit from reflation have participating, uh, including the base metals, I would expect that this group would, would join the rally shortly. Thanks so much, Dave. So global macro, uh, we use ETFs to express the global macro strategy, which is very different than several other global macro strategies out there um, and makes it very unique. So question is, it, um, what 
uh, ETFs out there do you feel are the greatest opportunity for upside this calendar year? And that comes from Paul in Toronto. Well, you know, if I were if I were building a portfolio of these reflation themes, I would certainly own one of the financial ETFs like KBE, which is banks. You could own the entire financial sector in the XLF. So that would be one piece. And I think that that's going to be very good risk reward. Uh, certainly, um, I would be focused on a dividend growth ETF. You know, this is where we're focused in the income portfolio right now. Our focus, you know, can be bonds. It could be corporate bonds, could be preferred shares, could be high dividend paying stocks. We are very clearly focused in dividend growth because dividend growth is what offsets rising rates. So that's a second ETF you might want to focus on. Certainly, I would have a look at uh, something that is commodity related. Um, I think that I probably would have uh, a position in XME, which owns both base metals and uh, gold miners. <clears throat> um, I would probably also have a, um, an industrials ETF uh, like VIS, which is a, a basket of, uh, of uh, industrials, transports, machinery, et cetera. Uh, and I might own FXD. Uh, which is uh, which is consumer discretionary. Now that's now that's U.S. and that gets you consumer discretionary financials. Um, it gets you the industrials and it gets you commodity. I probably also would want to make sure I had something that was international in nature. Um, and uh, some of the international ETFs we've talked about, like EWT, which is Taiwan, or DXJ, which is currency hedged, uh, Japan. Uh, you could look at. Um, the um, emerging markets, uh, internet, internet and commerce. You can see this is one of those that has pulled back recently, right back in the support. Uh, there's a good small companies, uh, small companies ETF, FFPI, which is small company international. Uh, so again, these these have pulled back in the support and might be something that also add uh, within that camp. Thanks so much, Dave. The next question comes from Bernard out of Toronto, and it deals specifically with um, Joe Biden's ambitious infrastructure plan. So there is a $2.25 trillion infrastructure plan that is being unveiled as we speak, um, and it's to be paid by corporate tax hikes. The cost is a major concern for GOP lawmakers as are plans to partially pay for the plan with tax increases. So his question is, um, how will higher corporate taxes affect profits? Well, certainly, you know, this, this is not coming as a surprise, right? This is something that has been talked about for a long time. I think that when the Biden administration came in, there was an expectation that we're going to see higher taxes. Uh, as it looks right now, the tax increases that are being talked about look like they might take out of, say, $200 in earnings in the S&P next year, could take as much as $10 in earnings. So we take earnings down from $2 per S&P unit to, sorry, to, uh, sorry, uh, two, 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 $2 in earnings to $1.90. Um, that's, that's, that's something that we can live with. Sorry, $200 to $190. Um, but it's, you know, we, we don't like to see higher taxes, but certainly there are groups that will cheer it on. Uh, you know, the, uh, the construction and building industry uh, look pretty attractive. This is the PKB, which is the ETF, which owns companies in the building and construction space. Uh, and this is one of the themes that we're invested in in the macro fund. Thanks so much, Dave. Last question for this afternoon, and probably one of your favorite questions to get, would you be putting new money or money that was sold earlier uh, last year, 2020, around this time, would you be putting new money to work in the short term or be waiting for a pullback? So this is a tough one for people because in a structural bull market, market can perform well for a long time with relatively shallow pullbacks. Think back to 2016, 17, two years of gains where the market's biggest pullbacks were one and a half percent. So I know it's not much solace for somebody who maybe has missed this rally or has taken money out of the market, you know, quite some time ago. 
Uh, I said last week it was possible we'd have some choppiness through quarter end, and I still think we could have a little bit of choppiness over the next two or three weeks. But I wouldn't expect much more than, you know, sort of top to bottom 5%. Um, and actually, the market has absorbed, and Diana, our head trader, and I were talking about this this morning, the fact that the market has absorbed about, you know, might what might have been $300 billion worth of selling into quarter end and really has had very little impact on the broad indices themselves tells you just how strong this market is. So I, I have to say that I wouldn't get too cute. Um, if we think we're still uh, in early stages of a new economic cycle and cyclical stocks are rallying for the first time in years, you might get a chance, but it may be that they buck, you know, buck pullbacks and, um, at the end of the day, I think over the next couple of years, we're going to have, you know, good solid returns in global stocks, right? Good solid returns in financials. And so, you know, if you're, if you're sitting on cash, I would certainly put some, some money to work here and, and maybe you break it up into two or three pieces and do it over the next month. But, um, you know, I think that it's going to wind up being a pretty decent year. Always sage advice, David. Thank you so much. Um, I will leave you with the final word, word as we don't have any further questions this afternoon. Well, look, um, quarter end is always interesting because there's lots of cross currents. Um, we're watching very closely. There's nothing that, that really has us overly concerned at this point. Um, certainly, we want to watch what happens with the long end of the U.S. bond market. If, if yields continue to work their way higher, this is the yield in the 10-year bond you know, it will continue to pose a problem for growth stocks. Um, I think that one of the things we're watching is the, uh, the long-term chart of the U.S. dollar. And certainly the U.S. dollars had a bounce off the lows at the end of last year, but we're running into declining moving average. My guess is U.S. dollar strength is not likely to last, uh, but we're watching that closely as well. Uh, and we'll continue to update as, as any changes take place. So thanks, Pam, for moderating again this week. And thanks, everyone, for joining us. And uh, please don't hesitate to give us a call if you'd like to have a conversation about your specific situation uh, or circumstance. We'd be happy to answer any questions you've got. Thanks so much, David. Thanks, everyone.